Asbury Park Museum presentation of Asbury Park, a segregated seashore retrospective. So this afternoon, we're going to take a step back in time to the 1880s. And of course, everyone's aware that this is the 150th anniversary of the founding of Asbury Park, 1871. But we're going to go back into the 1880s um, to do a reenactment of what life was like in that period of time with respect to um, segregation. And keep in mind, it wasn't just Asbury Park. It was all along the shore and all of them in the north. Um, and hopefully you'll have a chance to learn the nuances of what actually transpired in, um, you know, throughout the decades. And I know it's a very serious subject, but I think it may also be kind of fun because when you start to hear the, um, the text and the lines in the, of um, the verbiage of what's being communicated, it's like you say, uh-oh. And uh, so many ways, so there'll be a lot, a lot that you hear that you might feel uncomfortable with, but just keep in mind it's a part of the portrayal of history. So we're going to get started and enjoy the presentation. Good afternoon. A segregated seashore retrospective presented by the Asbury Park Museum. Throughout much of its history, Asbury Park has been a segregated city. And nowhere were those often unwritten policies more in evident than the resort's popular beaches, boardwalks, seaside hotels, and amusements. The story of segregation in Asbury Park, however, did not start at the very beginning. Founded in 1871 by James A. Bradley, the city was named in honor of American Methodist founder, Bishop Francis Asbury. The town was developed as a temperance resort, which restricted the sale of alcohol and disallowed beach bathing and fishing on Sunday. Bradley sold off parcels of cleared out land to the public, donated parcels along Grand Avenue to a number of churches of various faith, but retained private ownership and full control of the beachfront. Asbury Park quickly ascended to become a premier resort destination point along the Jersey Shore. As thousands of white tourists flocked to the oceanfront, a separate influx of black people came seeking employment in the hotels, shops, and restaurants of Bradley's service economy. Bradley meticulously laid out plans for developing Asbury Park, was largely built on the labor of local indigenous people, the Italian immigrants, an African American who had fled the Ku Klux Klan reign of terror in the southern states along with opportunities for employment in the north. An additional importation of 26 Italians laborers arrived last night. They worked in the new gas main trenches. Each man carried a huge bag or box containing his wardrobe and personal effects, and the entire party quickly disappeared in the misty recessions of the Italian Quarter, southwest of Springwood Avenue and Adams Street. Over a hundred natives of Italy have arrived on the west side since last Sunday, and the duties of the township, officers and policemen, are materially increased as a consequence. More foreign labor, in addition, importantly, of 26 Italian laborers arrived last night. They will work in the new main gas main trenches. Each man carried a huge large box containing his wardrobe. In the earlier years, the the largely African-American employees of the huge beachfront hotels were, if not exactly welcome, tolerated on the boardwalk and beach. After work hours, black hotel employees found time for relaxation and recreation. The wait staff of each grand hotel formed 
fraternity-like alliances, often com competing against rival hotels in sporting events like baseball, games, and foot races. By the early 1880s, the physical and economic growth of Bradley's beach town and rapid pace of its secular and commercial identity outgrew its humble spiritual origins. This led to heightened racial tension without, within the community described by the New York Times as enjoying greater social mobility than at Long Branch or at any other place along the coast. In 1885, a large excursion of 1,500 blacks visited the Asbury Park Resort, which was organized by the black community of Newark. Shortly afterwards, an article appeared in the New York Times in which white business leaders were quoted. The success of Asbury Park is threatened by the presence of black people in spaces frequented by tourists. They have mingled freely with the throngs of promenaders on Mr. Bradley's beach, listened to the music in the pavilion, disported the surf, skated the rinks, and rolled baby carriages in the avenues. The result has been that white guests have complained to us that colored persons were overstepping all bounds, intruding themselves in places where common sense should tell them not to go, and monopolizing public privileges to the exclusions of the whites. An editorial in the New York Freeman, owned and edited by Tom, T. Thomas Fortune, an African American, condemning calls to prevent black individuals from utilizing the public accommodations of Asbury Park. The colored people enjoy no privileges whatever in Asbury Park, except those voting, promenading on the beach, and bathing in the ocean. Of these privileges, the right to vote was protected by the Constitution, and I call upon Bradley to protect the rights of black individuals to promenade on the beach and bathe in the ocean. In doing so, I would recognize Bradley as a man far different character than those calling for the exclusion of black people. James Bradley would contend that. I personally possessed no racial prejudices. My concerns were solely regarding the economic viability of the resort. A bolster support from the town's white citizens. Reverend William H. Dickerson appealed to Bradley that the restrictions should apply to both the white and black citizens whose actions betrayed Asbury Park's code of conduct. The right thing to do is to weed out all bad characters, whether they be covered by white or black skin. We must discredit the notion that economic status defines its individual morality. Let the necessity of labor never take away a person's claim to respectability. One's financial ability to board at a hotel and dress well is not a criteria of one's moral worth. While white tourists accepted the presence of African Americans as members of the working service class, they persistently objected to sitting next to them on trains and lounging alongside of them in the surf. The colored people of the town are considerably excited over what they are pleased to call Mr. Bradley's unjust discrimination against their race. Asbury Park is a summer resort, and as such, it must cater to the wishes of those who patronize it. If the patrons of this place object to the number of servants that congregate on the boardwalk, the interests of the place demand that they shall be requested to keep off the walk, be they colored or white. A man was heard to remark yesterday that the hotel proprietors are becoming disgusted at the way Negroes are monopolizing this town. I lived in Asbury Park for three years. That was long as I could stand, the darkies. I would never own property there on that account, and the Citizens there should sustain Mr. Bradley and the press in keeping the Negroes in their place. That is what a prominent Washington lady now, an Ocean Grove summer resident and property owner, said to the press reporter yesterday. It speaks for itself. While Bradley declared himself to be a friend to the people of color, he owned one of the newspapers that was proclaiming that there were too many colored people in the resort area. The colored people are becoming a nuisance in Asbury Park. We allow them to vote, to have full standing and protection in law, but when it comes to social intermingling, then we object most seriously and emphatically. By uh, 1887, Bradley officially restricted all African Americans, 
both those who worked here as well as those who sought to vacation in Asbury Park from the beaches and other shore facilities. Bradley had signs posted throughout the community and stationed officers at pertinent shore locations prohibiting all black citizens from the beaches, bathing houses, pavilions, and promenades. Early voices who pushed back against attempts of restricting privileges, privileges of blacks on the waterfront were the Reverend William H. Dickinson, Andrew Chambers, T. Thomas Fortune, Reverend J. Francis Robinson, Reverend J. H. Morgan, Reverend A. E. Jensen, and Dr. W. J. Parks. There were backlash to Bradley's restrictions. Bradley's public stance drew backlash from the residents of West Park. Reverend J. Francis Robinson, pastor of West Park St. Stephen's AME Zion Church, was one of the leading voices against segregation and firmly rebuked Bradley from the pulpit. Uh, it was stated that from the pulpit at the African American Episcopal Zion Church on Union Avenue in Asbury Park on Sunday that an indignation meeting of the colored people in Asbury Park would be held at the church on Monday evening to protest against the published threats of Mr. Bradley. It, take, it takes uh, means, means to include the colored people from the, from the beach and on account of their mo monopolizing the seats uh, to include, exclude the white guests at the hotels and the uh, cottages. At last night's meeting, the church was dimly lit with kerosene lamps. There were about 250 people in the church when the meeting was called to order. A majority of the audience were women. About a score of white men sat in the rear end of the room and seven reporters occupied two tables in the front. <clears throat> Reverend James Francis Robinson was introduced as president of the meeting. There was a prolonged burst of applause and Mr. Robinson stepped forward and bowed. Friends and friends and colleagues and fellow citizens, I'm glad to see you all here tonight. I'm here to speak dispassionately, dispassionately in defense of our rights and liberties. This is what we are here for on this evening. We will take no dictation from James A. Bradley or any other white man on the face of this earth. We own land, we raise corn and wheat and cotton, and, and we helped save the Union. We are under the immediate protection of the general government. We love our race, and we propose to vindicate our race when it is imposed upon. A religion that looks at the color and not at the heart of a man is a howling lie. They have religion in their houses, but the devil is in their chimney. <laughs> where, where, where is the parlor filled with guests? And, and when did they refuse entrance to a colored man when they want a glass of water or a cocktail? I'm surprised that a man of Mr. Bradley's uh, intelligence and financial words should even attempt to crush the liberties of a race. God gave the earth to man, to all men, black and white. And Asbury Park Beach, <laughs> it was included. They say our bread and butter depends upon the white men and upon Mr. Bradley particularly. Uh, this article, I, uh, which I hold in my hand, and um, uh, is banned from the pen of Mr. Bradley. He says that he is the father of it. It is his child, and we are here to nurse it. What? <laughs> the, the, the Negroes of this town contribute much 
toward its support and prosperity as the poor white people. Mr. Bradley and the white people, they object to the Negroes on the beach where the free air of heaven blows. And yet, in the dining room, they are willing to have the Negro sweat right over them. In the barber shop, white people are willing to have our black hands upon their faces, and yet they object to our presence on the beach? What, what an intelligent man this uh, Bradley is. <laughs> shall, shall we sit and bear it? No. We will go on to the beach, and however bitter the pill for Mr. Bradley, he shall be made to swallow it. A lady friend of the Daily Press suggested... To avoid all trouble over the color line on the beach, a separate bathing ground should be set apart for the colors. I recommend locating it about a mile east of the boardwalk. <laughs> Bradley's stance on restricting people of color from the beach was met with outrage elsewhere in the region. An indignation meeting uh, was held at St. Mark's Church in New York City, New York where they met to, in sympathy of those brethren in Asbury Park and to protect, to protest, I'm sorry, the action of Bradley to exclude colored people from the beach. St. Mark's Church of New York passed a series of resolutions condemning the discriminatory action then made by Bradley. The Reverend Robinson was invited to speak. You know, some of these white people came to Asbury Park where worse than the colored people and their presence on the ocean plaza was more objectionable. There are classes among the colored people and he should not condemn them as a race of the, because of the misconduct of a few. Mr. Bradley might just as well try to hang his handkerchief on the horns of the moon as to keep out black men from the beach. We fought for liberty and for the salvation of this union, and we are going to enjoy the peace of it. Bradley's response to the protests were he defended his actions in an Asbury Park Press article from 1887, stating that... I understand they, they accuse me of being antagonistic to the Negro race. This is not so. I am and have always been a firm friend of the race. <laughs> but I would not be doing justice to the vast amount of capital that is invested in everywhere in Asbury Park if I allowed my sentimental feelings to assert themselves to the deterrent of this town. I'm free to admit that I wish to discourage the great number of colored people coming here, not because I have any feelings against them as a race, but because I find that the patrons of the park object to their great number. The number of colored and white people is disproportionate here, in the summer, and whenever that occurs, there will be trouble amongst the races. Now, for instance, there are 100 Italians here building the electric railway. Now, if they would stay on after the work is done, there would be nothing for them to do, and the same principle would be hold true in regard to the colored people. And any class here without work is in the way in the summer. As Asbury Park is not a benevolent institution, but a town operated on strict business principles and depending for its success on attractiveness and the ability to please the public. The business of Asbury Park is purely that of a summer resort, and what does not conduce to the end is an injury. I have a right to select my own guests in my own pavilions, and I think that the laws will bear me out. That's the best you can do. 
The Reverend Robinson organized a series of indignation meetings, rallies in opposition to civil law distinctions on the basis of skin color. On July 21st, 1887, excursion trains arrived at the Asbury Park Ocean Grove Station from the northern New Jersey cities of Newark, Orange, and Jersey City, and from Philadelphia to the south, all of them land, uh, loaded with black beachgoers. They met at the Ocean Grove Auditorium, where they celebrated Jubilee Day, singing spirituals and listening to speeches. Though none of the orators mentioned Bradley by name, their talk of liberty and freedom made clear what was on their minds. Another form of protest at the beach created by the Reverend Robinson was called the wade-in, in which black locals waded into the ocean en masse and lay upon the sand in defiance of the official restrictions. This was a precursor to the sit-ins that were popularized 80 years later in the 1960s. In those days, bathers would pay about 20 cents for rental of a bathing suit towel, and changing room before heading to the beach. But for the next couple of years, people of color were denied such bathing privileges in Asbury Park. In the early years, beachgoers were not allowed to wear their beachwear on the boardwalk. They were required to use changing rooms. Thus, without access to means uh, or means to the beach house, bathers could not have access to the beach. Under pressure to resolve the race issue in the summer of 1889, Bradley came up with what he felt was a solution. He proclaimed the hours between five and seven, generously, to be commission hours, which people of color could use the beach. Black bathers could only use one specific bathhouse run by Jacob Parker, a black boot black who operated out of the Second Avenue Pavilion. There, they could rent a changing room, along with a bathing suit and towel, specially marked commission hours, at a reduced rate of 15 cents. Bradley thought his idea of commission hours was brilliant. Of course he did. And his local newspaper wrote that the innovation had caused general satisfaction among the colored people and seems to provide a solution for the most difficult part of the colored question. Of course, the commission hour plan was doomed to failure as apparently black people didn't want to go to the beach at five any more than white people did. And during the first month after the plan was put into effect, the largest number of black bathers taking advantage of the solution was no more than six. Please make sure you know it's 5 a.m. Do not listen to the narrator. <laughs> we should be mindful that Asbury Park had a presence beyond New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania borders. The hypocrisy of the North, an editorial in the Texas Fort Worth Daily Gazette, July 5th, 1889. Even if the northern hotels and sleepers did refuse to take the medicine they insisted upon prescribing for their southern contemporaries in the pure and purifying waters of Coney Island, Long Branch, Cape May, Nantucket, Asbury Park, and other resorts, all men would be free and equal among a people who so strenuously insisted upon such equality among other people. This compromise does not admit the races into the water during the same hours and marks the towels, lest by chance the white hand and leg should be dried on the linen that had performed the same service for the black hand and leg a week before. Viva la humbug. A year later, in 1890, James Bradley established a separate area for people of color, setting aside a strip of beach and boardwalk between First and Second Avenues for their exclusive use. He employed black bathhouse attendants and lifeguards with the designated area, for which, at least for the first year, black bathers were restricted 
to the hours between 3 and 5 p.m. Having successfully restricted African Americans from much of the beach, white hotel managers then began pressing Bradley to have them removed from the boardwalk and the pavilions. And in 1893, Bradley obliged, posting large signs forbidding the pavilion entrance to members of the colored race. This latest action was met with great indignation by the local black residents. A community meeting was quickly held in West Park at Marrow Hall, chaired by the Reverend William H. Dickerson. The much talk of mass meetings of the colored race was held last night at Marrow Hall on West Park. At 8 p.m., about 100 people assembled, but as the news spread, a crowd numbering nearly 500 crowded into the little room and clustered around the open doors of the windows after 40 white people were noticed in attendance. The meeting was called to discuss the signs which James A. Bradley had posted on the pavilion forbidding, forbidding their occupancy to the colored race. We're here tonight to discuss calmly and dispassionately a question that has confounded men ever since its inconception. The question of the association of the white and colored races. The main issue tonight is an indiscriminate prejudice against the colored race, which is in truth, in fact, is unreasonable as it is rampant. It has no foundation in philosophy or law to say that a man's skin has anything to do with his heart and his soul is to make a statement that cannot be proved. Mr. Bradley has undoubtedly had sufficient cause in his own mind to prohibit the colored people from the pavilions. He has been urged to the action by hotel guests who have been annoyed by some colored rascals who have deliberately made themselves obnoxious. Mr. Bradley would probably say that the just must suffer with the unjust. This is a mistake. He should discriminate. There are white men in Asbury with whom I would not associate with. A white man met me at the Fisher Pier today, and his first remark was, I'm glad the troublesome Negroes have been driven from the beach. They ought to be shot. To my mind, he represents, in large degree, those who have been petitioning Mr. Bradley. This should not be. Mr. Bradley's heart is in the right place. If they would only let it stay there. The resolution has been proposed that hotels and cottagers should not employ colored persons. Try it, and they will find out that the white servants are just as obnoxious. I ask you, how can the moral and civic lapses of a few people of a given class be held against an entire race? It does seem strange that many of our friends on the other side do not seem to be able to distinguish the difference between colored people in regards to moral, religion, or the right of manhood. And those of them who admit, admit it, seem to view the same light as the boy who visited a country fair and saw a cow that looked all the world like his father's cow. You could not tell them apart. All colored people are alike. Seems that the maxim, especially if there's a finance to be considered either by action against us or indifference towards us. Um, here it says I'm supposed to be greeted with applause. Can we... I came here because I am interested in speaking to the people who feel aggrieved at my notices. I have a regard for colored people. I never use the word nigger or even darky in referring to them. My little colored boy receives the same wages as my white lad and he wears that same hat. 
only he uses two of my one. The previous speaker made some errors. He said, I wanted to please everybody. Most people think the opposite. If I take a notion, I carry it out in spite of anything or anybody. I am called self-willed. I sympathize with the Negroes and deplore the pain that the notices have given them. It is a God-given right to breathe God's air and look on his ocean. The colored people are promised work daily in my hotels. Business is slack and fulfillment of these promises is postponed. It is the state affairs that brings so many colored people to the beach. They like to come here. The number of Negroes along the beach, it's too great. It is disproportionate. Most of the colored people here are employees. Most of the white people are employers. In their city homes, they do not associate with their servants as they rightly do not desire to be, compelled to do so when they arrive to the seashore. The great business of Asbury Park is that of keeping borders. Suppose I should concede all that the colored people wanted. Well, you say that. The whites would then leave. The resort would be... <laughs> Amen to whoever said that. Um, the whites would then leave. The resort would be ruined and your means of livelihood gone. There are property owners whom I am bound to protect. Colored people must not occupy the pavilions. I am sorry to say that the rule is unalterable and must continue. I do not want to be guilty of any inhumanity. However, I cannot say what I shall do before the season is over. I cannot see my way out of the question yet. I can't tell what my duty shall be, but be assured that I have no ill will to the colored race. The law of New Jersey does not conflict with my placards. The beach is my private property, and as though it was my parlor, I have the power of ordering anyone to leave it. I put, whom, I put out whom I please. I do not want you in the pavilions, and I tell you so. The following year, Bradley changed the wording of the signs he'd hung in the pavilions. Instead of barring black individuals from using the pavilions, the signs were changed to bars, bar employees of hotels from being in them. The change in language was done so as to create a race-neutral rationale for excluding black people from the pavilions. Over time, the perception of acceptance of blacks on the beachfront appeared to be on the upswing with many clubs and cottages on Asbury Park's west side being an additional huge draw for black Americans. In the early 1900s, Asbury Park was said to be the New Jersey shore town most open to elite black Americans seeking a weekend or a holiday at the ocean. One of the most prominent black newspapers of its time, from 1887 to 1960, the New York Age, owned by T. Thomas Fortune in Red Bank, reported in 1906. Fewer restrictions on account of color in Asbury Park this season than during any past season. And a movement is on foot among the property owners to remove every vestige of discrimination on account of color. By 1903, Bradley had relinquished control of the waterfront, selling the beach to the city. Five years later, it's 1911, a peculiar condition exists on the oceanfront at Asbury Park this season due to the attempt of someone in authority to shut out the colored visitors entirely from enjoying the bathing privileges of the deep blue sea. 
When college visitors reached their normal Second Avenue swimming location, they were surprised to learn that they no longer had privileges at this beach. At a subsequent Sunday afternoon indignation meeting at Second Baptist Church, it was agreed that the community would swim anywhere along the beach that they desired. The commission recognized that this was intended as a test if they were to arrest any of the beachgoers. They also recognized that the city would likely lose in court. So on July 4th, the large crowd composed of white and colored pleasure seekers witnessed the unusual spectacle of both races bathing together, a state of affairs that has not existed at Asbury Park for years. So long have the colored people been using, used to bathing together that they do not seem to be anxious at all about mingling in the ocean with the whites, who on the other hand, do not seem to be particular about mixing either. And by the way, Reverend um, A.E. Jensen, rector of St. Augustine's Episcopal Church, and Dr. W. Parks led the fight for bathing grounds for Negroes. And many of you may not be aware, um, Dr. Parks is the gentleman who owned the house that was eventually donated and became the Westside Community Center. That's just a little sidebar. Now, the backdrop to the beach having been closed to the colors, a new building, which included a swimming pool, was recently elected on the boardwalk at the same site formerly occupied by the bath bathhouses used for the colored bathers. And that would be the Second Avenue pool or the natatorium. So the action by the commission to close the First and Second Avenue Beach to the color bathers was to remove their presence from view of the white vacationers. Now, to avoid publicity or legal obstructions, the commission arranged for 32 beach houses to be built and erected at Asbury Park's north end. The beach houses were carted on wagons and set on the sand north of the fishing pier at 8th Avenue. They probably did it at night. There was an immediate uproar and protest by the hotel and college owners located in the North End, which thwarted the plans to relocate the Negro Beach. And at the same time, the colored citizens threatened to show their displeasure at the polls for having been deprived of their favorite swimming spot between First and second avenues. So the commission rectified the situation by reopening the first and second avenue beach for the colored citizens. The beach houses were then taken to first avenue and set up on the sand until a permanent cement houses could be constructed in the fall. The segregated Second Avenue beach arrangements therefore continued until 1915, as did the continued protest of hotel managers in the heart of the hotel district. So they didn't want them in the north, they didn't want them in the south. <laughs> Eventually, the Beach Commission capitulated to the petitions of the Second Avenue hotel managers and the bathing area for people of color was moved in 1915, where? To a spot tucked away south of the casino at the foot of Wesley Lake. In 1928, the original casino burned down and then a new larger casino was built at that location along with the power plant structure. These structures effectively blocked white beachgoers' view of their black fellow bathers. This bathing area for people of color was called the mud hole, sometimes variously referred to as the ink well, and according to one individual's recollections, the pipe beach. The mud hole remained the only place in Asbury Park where black people could swim through the 1940s and into the 1950s. As local jazz artist Eddie Watt recalled to his son, Robert Lee Watt. You know, when I wanted to swim after work on those hot summer days, I was not 
allowed to go into the swimming pools down at the beach. Even although the sign on the building did say in great big letters, public bathing. Those crackers laughed as they told me, hey boy, why don't you go on over to the colored beach and swim? But you might drown trying because there's lots of sewer pipes in that water. For years it was said that wastewater from city sewers flowed from the pipe that led out into the ocean in front of the colored beach. While some have disputed this, it was and still is the perception of many of the city's black residents. The actual explanation for the pipe is that it was the wastewater from the natatorium pool and not sewage. Discouraged by their treatment at the Asbury Park Beach, many black residents would in later years prefer to swim at the beach in nearby Belmar. <laughs> I'll get to it. Which had abandoned the concept of segregated areas in 1928 and opened the entire beach to all races. Yes, yeah, so this is an image from Madonna Carter's book, a photo taken by Joe Carter. And on the far rest is the matriarch of our city, Ms. Faye Hudson. And the second to the left is Joan Carter. And she would be this, the daughter of Dr. Parks. So while that tradition has, a, has faded away in recent years, the practice of black bathers favoring Belmar's Beach over that of Asbury Park had remained in place for decades. Discrimination endures through the 20th century. While we associate the, the presence of more blatant racism in the South, most of us realize that uh, the, uh, there was a presence of the KKK in Monmouth County. What you might not recognize is how the KKK grew to become mainstream and socially acceptable for a period of time in the early 20th century, including in Asbury Park. In 1923, theater program from the Savoy Theater included several ads prominently placed by the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. In 1916, black activist and future civil rights advocate Lorenzo Harris Sr. arrived in Asbury Park, having found a hostile reception to his presence in the beach at Atlantic City. The only way that the creator of spectacular and uh, sand sculptures could practice his trade in Asbury Park was to portray himself as an Arab rather than a Virginia-born and college-educated African-American. Eventually, abandoning this rouge, Lorenzo Harris would go on to found the local chapter of the NAACP along with his wife, Catherine, become a founding member and president of the Westside Community Center, serve as an officer of the original Asbury Park Historical Society, and inspire his physician son, Dr. Lorenzo Harris, Jr., to become the first person of color elected to Asbury Park City Council. In 1934, Lorenzo's wife, Catherine Harris, was involved in a dispute with a ticket booth operator of the Boardwalk Merry-Go-Round when they refused to sell her young niece a ticket because of her race. When the operator forcibly removed the child from the merry-go-round, a physical altercation occurred and the police were called. Lorenzo and Catherine took the owners of the merry-go-round to court and pressed charges. The matter was settled when the merry-go-round owners took out a half-page ad in the local newspaper stating that it was not their policy to discriminate. During, the, uh, during a 1985 interview with the Associated, I'm sorry, with the Asbury Park Press, Catherine Harris recounted the incident of her niece being denied access to the carousel house. I had been part of the committee that went to council asking that this type of thing be stopped. So this encounter should never have happened. After the ticket operator refused to sell my brother-in-law and these two tickets, I put my mouth where the small hole in the cage was and said, 
He wants two tickets, lady. He wants two. Two tickets. She ignored me and kept pushing that one ticket and nickel change. The operator came over and snatched the ticket out of her hands and pointed to what was printed on the back. Management reserves the right to refuse service to whomever they cared to. You're not going to ride. You can get away from here because you're a troublemaker. <laughs> you are here running this business, catering to the public, and we are part of that public, and we demand to be served. I took the ticket, put it in my niece's hand, put her up on the horse, and stood there. The operator took the ticket out of her hand and took her off of the merry-go-round horse. I grabbed him in the front by his shirt with my right hand and the back with my left hand, and I was trying to batter his head into that wooden horse. <laughs> but he reached up and grabbed my wrist and squeezed it till I had to release him. He told the woman in the ticket booth, call the police. The policeman told the man that he was wrong and to give the ticket back. The man was so angry, his lips were trembling. You take this ticket and you ride, and after that, do you get away from here because you're a troublemaker? I said, this is not the end. It is only the beginning. We will meet again. After telling my husband Lorenzo what had happened, he said, we'll take care of that tomorrow. We were going to court to press charges. It was in the paper, and we'd called our friends. So the courtroom was packed. We had our lawyer. The concession owners, Seegers and Goldberg, were very apologetic and denied that they would want anything like that to happen. No, indeed. We wanted the woman fired, but they pleaded, oh, she's a widow, she has children to raise. So they denied emphatically, right through the whole thing, that it was the policy that it was the policy to do such a thing. Lorenzo said, if you insist that it's not the policy, and if you will make a statement to that effect and publish it in the press, we'll drop it. We'll settle for that. Oh, yes, Mr. Harris, we're willing to do that. You can go to the press with us, and you can write it. We'll take half a page ad, and you can word it for us. From now on, I assure you, this will never happen again. And that is how it was settled. All the concessions were open to Negroes then. Well, of course, instances of discrimination did not come to an end at that point. I think you all realize that. People of color were still outright turned away from the boardwalk establishments, such as the Monte Carlo pool. And uh, that was built, of course, by uh, movie theater magnate Walter Reed. And they were turned away from the natatorium. They were seated in balconies of the Reed-owned theaters and they were refused service in restaurants. Most instances of discrimination went unreported. Discrimination acts uh, or words were at times were more subtle, at least uh, to the individuals uh, taking action. In September 1938, Walter Reed ran a full page ad in an attempt to persuade a candidate to withdraw his name as a candidate for running for office. Reed used language offensive to the black community while seemingly oblivious that he was doing so. Dear Bill, owing to the fact that you don't know the difference between a con man and a minute man, meaning native born white Americans, I shall try to explain this to you. I am seizing this opportunity to tell the colored boys and girls 
not to be so crazy as to sell their vote for a dollar apiece. Where I was born, in Selma, Alabama, if a man like you had lived there, they would run you out on a rail for being an N-word lover, which is the term used for politicians who expect to get elected to office with one particular race or color. I can assure you that my record and performances in employing colored people throughout my circuit of theaters is of sufficient evidence that as far as I'm concerned, I have taken care of the colored people with wages and positions throughout my entire life and business career. And God bless my colored mammy who raised me until I was 16 years old in my southern home of Selma, Alabama, USA, where I was born. <laughs> well, the uh, the reaction from the citizens to whom Reed was trying to appeal responded swiftly with their own large layout in the AP press. The black citizens listed in the AP press responded were Walter J. Upperman, prominent AP attorney, F. Leon Harris, funeral director, Lorenzo Harris, community activist and founding member of the NAACP and illustrator for the NAACP's Crisis Magazine, Dr. J.C. McKelvey, Long Branch president of the NAACP Atlantic Highlands, and Dr. James W. Parker from Red Bank. In 1942, the play The Native Son was running at the Paramount Theater, which was owned by Reed. And it had a nationally acclaimed actor, a black actor, Canada Lee. When Lee and another black cast member and Lorenzo Harris objected to not being served at the Boardwalk restaurant, they were assaulted. Two restaurant waiters were later charged. By 1950, Asbury Park was undergoing a transformation. The post-war era saw more Americans owning cars than ever before, and the parkway provided direct route to Asbury Park for working class families. <clears throat> After years of depression and a world war, Asbury Park was again a favorite summer destination, with its rides and its amusements, and it included paddle boats and swan boats on Wesley Lake and even pony rides on the boardwalk. While it was a different sort of resort than the one that had been beckoned well-to-do folk during the Gilded Age of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Asbury Park was still perfect for a day trip or even a vacation of a week or two. 1960s and beyond. Black people, however, continued to find themselves unwelcomed at the boardwalk pools throughout the 1960s, even though those pools, the last of which was closed in 1971, entered their finer years of operation. Claire Garland, the director of the Sand Hill Indians Historical Association and the Asbury Park Museum advisor, recalls her mother marching on the boardwalk with others in, in the early 1960s to protest discrimination on the waterfront. At the same time, an amusement centers like the Palace Complex and the Casino relaxed their restrictive practice of decades past. And by the late 1950s and 60s, local school-age children were offered strips of 10 tickets for a dollar to attend Wednesday morning double feature movies at the city's movie houses and a program that included live entertainment and uh, during the intermissions. 21st century. While Asbury Park's comeback in the 21st century has seen a more diverse city emerge from the economically depressed and largely abandoned ghost town of the 1970s and 80s and into the 90s, the waterfront 
did not see a lar large, uh, would not, the waterfront did not see a large number of black, Hispanic, and Haitian acquiring employment in the customer facing boardwalk jobs until recent years. The first new businesses to open in the early 2000s were not very receptive to the presence of blacks on the boardwalk, nor did many of those businesses tend to employ many persons of color. Since then, boardwalk businesses owners have come to see the value in providing employment opportunities for the residents of greater Asbury Park area. Because most of the jobs are seasonal, however, the positions tended to attract younger people rather than older who desire to stay year-round for employment. Today, the youngest of the generation of beachgoers are likely oblivious to the history of Asbury Park's segregated seashore, a history that was largely suppressed in the official record for many years. But for those with an interest in building a stronger, more truly diverse community from the lessons of an often shameful past, the beaches and boardwalks resonate with righteous indignation, the chance of protest and the summertime laughter of all of those who fought for dignity, rights, and respect in the city of Sandcastle Dreams.